very good afternoon to all of you. Indeed, a pleasure to be here this afternoon. And at the outset, my sincere thanks to all the panelists for joining us this afternoon for this particular session, which talks about green finance and climate adaptation and resilience for the coastal cities. Friends, uh, climate change is the topic, is the theme for this particular conference. And you must have heard over the last couple of days, individuals and a lot of experts who have dwelt upon it. So we wanted to make a little different in terms of the fact that what is it that can be done to facilitate financially, sustainability-wise, and even from an efficiency and effectiveness perspective to have this particular natural changes to be done with little less damage and at the same time to come out very successfully. So we have a great set of panelists today and uh, without wasting too much of a time on this particular introduction, maybe uh, I'll just request each panelist initially to share for two or three minutes their perspective about this particular theme. And if uh, uh, Mr. Shankar Jadav is here, he's already connected. Uh, good afternoon, Shankar. Could you hear me? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yes, I can hear you clearly. Yes. I just wanted to request you, maybe you can just do a little start in terms of what has been your perspective as far as this topic is concerned. And then I would request uh, Namita thereafter to give her perspective. Over to you, Shankar. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I believe this is a great thing that India is doing, and especially Mumbai is doing, in respect to the climate. Uh, Mumbai, as you all know, has been pioneering in the financial field and considered to be a financial capital of the country. And this financial capital has been also a pioneer in getting financial funds or otherwise in regulatory means etc uh, for funding of uh, the climate change and environment basically bse is a part of the sustainable exchange initiative and we've been having indices like carbonx and greenx for more than a decade now where the companies that carry on uh, things which are environment friendly which are sustainable are rewarded or incentivized. Further to that, even our regulator, say SEBI, etc., they have brought out various frameworks in which the organizations will report. For instance, the business responsibility report was something that was mandated to be reported by SEBI for the top organizations. This year onwards, SEBI has mandated the BRSR, which uh, you, uh, includes uh, the principles, national principles as well as global principles on climate change sustainability. Remember that whenever we talk about sustainability or climate change, people always talk about E, S and G together. Corporate governance has always been a part of uh, all the financial initiatives that our regulators and uh, exchanges have taken. The sustainability and especially the environment, these two topics came in later, but today all three considered together are very important. And I'm happy to let you know that there are many funds, for instance, some medium term notes, we have been able to finance some of the initiatives through our international exchange in the gift city. The Mumbai uh, BSC at Mumbai has been funding local bodies like the municipal corporations to get funds for initiatives that help the environment. And this has been continuing process not only in the exchange, but as uh, most of the organizations that we are talking in Mumbai. The world over, the funds to uh, sustainability rather than uh, only climate have grown large and is expected to reach around two and a half trillion dollars uh, or around 20% of uh, the funds that are available to say the European area are moving towards the uh, ESG part. India is not in the top three, but it's surely in the top 10, 20, uh, and will be racing ahead. What with the union government and the state government, it's trying to look at the renewable energy, trying to look at how we become frugal 
and reduce our carbon footprints? How do we have sustainable projects going on? India is rapidly urbanizing. And one of the woes of urbanization is that the energy usage leads to a high carbon footprint and pollution in the cities. Like uh, our chief minister in Maharashtra mentioned yesterday that uh, Mumbai has taken initiative to reduce the emissions in the city itself. Though we are largely dependent on fossil fuel even now, the union government has announced and likely to meet the targets for renewable energy uh, to be a mainstay in India. I know we are a developing country. The per capita energy usage is very, very low. But at the same time, we also see that there are many people who use more energy than the lower strata of the society. We require to improve the standard of living and we have to learn how we will go towards sustainable uh, progress of this country and the cities. With more than half the population in cities, I think climate change and especially cities like Mumbai, which are the coastal side, is a very important topic. I can see in the near future, lots of issues piled up for listing or getting funds, which are based on the ESG themes. Many of the investors nowadays are realizing that organizations which follow the ESG themes, do something in sustainability, environment, as well as manage corporate governance well, are likely to do well and return uh, on investment in these investments will be very high. Uh, one of the things that has happened uh, in the last few years is that securitization of debt funds, as well as uh, getting uh, retail investors to look at the ESG-based themes that organizations are implementing the projects on. I think looking at this, we see a great future for getting funds uh, for this initiative and it will work well. I think I will stop here and uh, we can have the panel discussion now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Shankar. Thank you for your insights. Uh, pretty much uh, insightful about your perspective. Maybe I would now request uh, Navita, please, uh, your, you can share your perspective about this theme. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kushro, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's indeed a pleasure to be here. This is my first time out after the COVID, so I'm glad to see everybody physically and not through a screen. And uh, yeah, hopefully COVID is behind us, but that, I think, brings us to another defining crisis of our time, that's climate change. You've been discussing that since uh, yesterday. The sizzling heat waves in Mumbai are proof enough that, uh, you know, this is a grievous climate reality and we need to act. With IPCC warning a 1.5 degree scenario by 2040, this has significantly raised the stakes for coastal cities. So more floods, more droughts, more storms, a rising sea level. This is likely to flood the vulnerable areas and urban areas like Mumbai. However, I think the good news is that there is a window of opportunity that exists. And there's a requirement for urgent action. Over the last two, uh, one and a half days, you would have heard of what kind of action is required. But I think for me to put out three areas, one is encouraging na natural infrastructure, ecosystem-based adaptation responses, such as coastal wetlands restoration. I think that's very important. Technological, architectural, and urban planning responses, such as flood risk mapping, and adjustments in socioeconomic systems to reduce vulnerability. But then the question that we arrive at is that all this needs huge amount of finance that would harness the opportunities and the critical benefits, uh, such as avoiding maybe flood damage, particularly in urban areas. Adaptation finance has been a pressing priority with developing nations requiring almost about $70 billion annually and about $500 billion by 2050. So obviously the amount and the scale of capital that is required would also need very robust policies and this accompanied by innovative financial products, also terms, lending terms. So for example, I mean, uh, one of the be very good steps in the direction is the Mumbai Climate Action Plan, uh, which is estimated to need about $920 million uh, towards achieving a net zero Mumbai by 2050. And this itself is a huge opportunity for financial institutions that are very much here in this financial capital to translate 
opportunities into actual transactions, mobilizing the green capital uh, that would enable adaptation, resilience building in the city. Because what we've seen is most of the capital is going towards mitigation. And I think while the financial shortfalls are there, one needs to also understand the challenges that are there uh, which financial institutions face, right? For example, greening or biodiversity or waste management kind of projects, these are often very based on unproven concepts or technologies, and therefore it becomes very high risk for investors or lenders to come in. The largely asset collateral driven uh, banking, uh, bank lending culture in India makes it very tough to get credit for such high risk perceived projects. Then of course there's dependency, very high dependency on externalities and variables long gestation periods of these kind of projects where banks and lenders are looking at short-term uh, uh, you know, deployment of capital. So how do we match that? And then you know, banks in India are still at a very nascent stage as far as climate risks are concerned. So mapping physical and transition risks, uh, I think that's very nascent at the moment. And with no regulatory or systemic framework, I think that looks to be a distant away. Having said that, there are huge opportunities as far as um, you know, green finance is concerned, and it's all fast evolving. We've seen that uh, the green bond issuances has reached seven billion US dollars. Uh, sovereign green bonds that the government of India has uh, announced is going to pave the uh, path for uh, diversified uh, issuers, uh, creating a huge market where public sector uh, participation will be there. And then we've also seen one other category come up, which is the sustainability linked loans, uh, where the interest rate is really uh, basis the sustainability performance of certain KPIs that uh, the borrower agrees to. Uh, one very big thing is the Union Bank uh, signing up a first overseas sustainability linked loan of $1.5 billion. Uh, with, so this, this capital will be deployed towards uh, you know, those borrowers who will commit to bringing down GHG emissions or responsible business methods. Therefore, the, method, uh, the momentum is picking up. Domestic issuances, rupee denominated bonds, we are seeing a lot of activity. I think one other point here and last point is that how do we leverage public finance? How does public finance really play that catalytic role uh, to bring in more of private capital. I think that is the, that is the key. And as far as, uh, you know, the opportunity here is the Mumbai Climate Action Plan, can we look at a blueprint financing facility, uh, which will really talk about how does, where is this $920 million coming from and how that will be deployed. So uh, that would be really interesting to see. Uh, I think one other uh, area which there also needs government intervention is climate measurement and data collection. I think to inform the capital plans, this would really complement the overall road to net zero. So finally, opportunities are galore. Linking policy, financial tools, data collection, management, these are very critical enablers to build resilience in cities or in regions, uh, which is accountable and in a very transparent manner. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Namita. Really appreciate it, thank you. May I now request uh, Stein Shep, who is basically a partner with Wolf's company, an environmental economist, to give his own perspective, more particularly from an international standpoint. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kush. Um, so, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, for those who don't know me, uh, I'm from Amsterdam, Stein Schep. I work with uh, Wolf's Company, which is a yeah, small advisory company that specializes specifically in yeah, the valuation of natural capital, uh, the value of ecosystems, and specifically to achieve yeah, economic development and, and societal challenges. Um, and we basically yeah, focus on two types of activities. First of all, we evaluate uh, projects, investments in uh, infrastructure that also affect nature and natural resources. So for example, if you build a road, a dam, a dike, um, this will affect your nature and have an impact on the economics that depend on that natural ecosystem. And what we do is we evaluate those investments to see how natural options compare to hard infrastructure options. 
And we often see that those options with, uh, yeah, that are inclusive of nature, nature-based solutions, if you will, uh, have much higher values, much higher values for society um, than those hard infrastructure options, precisely because these natural ecosystems provide so many benefits, not only coastal protection, but also sequester carbon um, or provide uh, livelihoods for people that depend on those. Now, why don't we see a lot of these nature-based solutions happening at the moment? Uh, they're relatively new, um, and recently we conducted a study with the Dutch Enterprise Agency to investigate yeah, how, how you could scale up um, the, the number of nature-based solutions that are being implemented, but also the size of those projects uh, that are being implemented. And we specifically looked at ways to finance those type of, of nature-based solutions. And um, yeah, basically, um, yeah, there, because these, these nature-based solutions have a variety of benefits, this provides the opportunity compared to yeah, traditional infrastructure options like dams, dikes for, for coastal protection, to also generate revenue and attract finance from private sector. Um, one of the logical yeah, uh, um, uh, financing mechanisms that you can apply to those type of nature-based solutions are those of uh, carbon credits. Uh, blue carbon credits if we're talking about coastal ecosystems like mangroves, for example. Um, and we conducted this market study to investigate the potential of such mechanisms um, and also to identify potential structures yeah, to, to, to uh, actually make projects happen, right? Um, and what we saw is that there's a great potential to invest in uh, blue carbon. Uh, we see the mar carbon market uh, yeah, basically increasing very rapidly at the moment, and specifically those carbon credits in, in the voluntary markets related to ecosystem restoration, blue carbon, they're really picking up uh, uh, quite rapidly. And the prog yeah, prognosis for coming years are that they're going to quadruple uh, uh, within 10 years. And, and this provides really an opportunity to, to invest in, uh, in coastal protection projects based on nature restoration. Um, still, nature uh, restoration uh, in combination with, with yeah, hard infrastructure for coastal protection is still a very costly uh, endeavor, and carbon credits are probably not enough to finance the whole projects um, that you need to, to implement uh, to protect a city like Mumbai, for example. Um, so what you need is you need public-private partnerships that combine private investment with public finance, potentially loans from development institutions, in order to, yeah, to develop structures where you can combine private with public finance. Um, but these are, yeah, quite, they're not new structures. Uh, these structures are happening for other type of infrastructural projects as well. But for nature-based solutions, this is still difficult because this is such a new and immature market. And the projects for nature-based solutions are at the moment relatively small scale, while investors are looking for large projects to invest in. Um, and there's really a disconnect yet still between investors and project, project implementers. And what we're also seeing is that because public um, uh, or coastal protection is traditionally a very public endeavor, uh, governments are investing in public, uh, in public goods such as coastal protection, we see that uh, a lot of these projects are still depending on procurement. Procurement by governments, by development institutions for, nature, yeah, for coastal protection basically. And often these procurement um, processes don't include nature-based solutions specifically, and the need to include nature-inclusive uh, aspects in those coastal protection strategies. And um, in, in addition, these nature-based solutions are so new that they require adaptive management. And also often these procurement processes don't, yeah, don't align with, with the need for this adaptive management. It's much easier to decide for a dike or a, or a dam which knows exactly yeah, you know exactly what it's going to do for you to protect your city. Well, mangrove restoration, we know that it's going to help to protect your city, but to what extent exactly, and the, the results are more uncertain. So you need more adaptive management in these uh, public procurement processes as well, and room, room to attract private investment as well. And this also means that you need to adapt your legal framework um, in order to allow for these changes in, in, uh, in processes. 
Despite these challenges, we also see that there is a great opportunity because yeah, foreign investors are increasingly looking for nature-inclusive uh, ways to invest. Uh, governments want to have nature-inclusive ways to adapt to climate change. And we also see that there are a lot of project implementers that are building knowledge to um, yeah, indeed develop those nature-based solution projects. So we do really see that there's a lot of opportunity, but yeah, these challenges are still, still there, and I hope we have some more discussion about this in the panel to see how we can overcome these. Thank you. Thank you, Stein. Really appreciate your perspective. Maybe I would now request uh, Aaron Vermeulen, who is a director with Green Finance Unit at the WWF Netherlands, to share some of the thoughts and the global best practices. Sure. Thanks, Thank uh, Kush, and uh, good uh, morning, afternoon, everyone. Um, Namita already mentioned it, huh? the, the, the gap for climate adaptation finance is huge. Uh, yearly we are lacking about uh, between half to one trillion dollars a year to uh, address climate resilience. And uh, that money is not going to be uh, bridged by uh, public or philanthropic spending. So we really need to think about ways how to mobilize private companies, private investors, to come up with uh, scalable climate solutions. Um, a little bit more about climate change and cities. You see problems being stacked. So temperature rise, sea level rise, storm intensity, and also urbanization. And if you look at the business as usual, these, these problems are currently addressed with a kind of a sticking band-aid. So there's a storm or there's a, a flood in half of the year, so uh, cities are building levees and dikes. And then the other half of the year, there, there are droughts. And then uh, cities are building desalinization plants to provide uh, people with, um, with, with drinking water. And actually, that is a very short-term type of um, yeah, solution that is also providing some risk to become stranded assets, yeah? drying, drowning assets, and also scaring away the private sector. So we really need to change the way we are investing in cities and really looking at a city-wide landscape involving multi-stakeholders to, to think about what are the real climate risks and what are the solutions to these climate risks and what are the opportunities that are investable and, and, and catered for the private sector. So what is my organization, WWF, doing about this? Um, we are a part of a consortium called the Dutch Fund for Climate and Development, which is a consortium of two uh, investors, one development bank and one private equity firm, uh, and one NGO and, uh, on working on a more agricultural side, and one NGO, myself, working on the environmental side. And this fund is a 160 million grant from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Netherlands, uh, with the aim to mobilize over half a billion private sector money in OECD DAC countries, uh, specifically looking at climate resilience. And how do we do that? So the, out of the 160 million, 30 million has been reserved to really look at this landscape angle and to set up multi-stakeholder platforms and really think, okay, what kind of long-term solutions can we think about? But also, that money is used to create pipeline. So supporting businesses uh, with small grants in the size between 50 to 250,000 euros to really develop a solid business plan to become investable. Um, but also we are looking at the regulatory issues and the enabling environment that is conducive to private sector companies to actually make the investment. Um, so one example I can share with you is uh, the Ho Chi Minh City, which is uh, sitting in the sinking and shrinking uh, delta. Uh, so it's shrinking and sinking because of erosion, uh, not enough sedimentation coming through the Mekong River to, uh, to, to the city, but also over extraction of groundwater. So we have now developed a whole portfolio of companies, not only in the city, but also in the hinterland, so in the, in the delta itself, that are restoring the environmental flows by, for instance, um, an alternating rice and aquaculture projects where the sediment flows are being restored. In that way, the sinking uh, trend in the Mekong Delta uh, really being reduced. So to end, um, I think private sector money and mobilization is possible, but you need grant instruments to, uh, to kickstart it all. So city-wide, landscape-wide planning is, is essential. 
also thinking about sequencing of different investment is really important. So what public sector project do you need that then can enable uh, a following up private sector investment after that? Uh, but also pipeline. So how can you develop uh, bankable, investable projects with private sector companies and they're not up for grabs? So it's great that we're developing all kinds of sophisticated financial instruments, but you need underlying assets and proceeds to come to that. So you need to put blood, sweat and tears in that. And then of course blended finance. So these, comp these uh, um, business cases uh, continue to be uh, risky, so you need de-risking instruments, um, subordinated debt coming from grants like we received from the government of the Netherlands and really develop blended finance instruments uh, to, to make it happen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Erin. Maybe I would now request uh, Debirat Sen, who is the head of global banking at North India HSBC, to give his download. Thank you. Thank you, Gusho. Hello, Mumbai. Uh, I am not a resident of your lovely city, and I come from Delhi. So as I was, as I was taking a flight from a very sweltering North India today, and coming to your lovely city, it was time to think through that you know, this event couldn't have been more timely. And uh, thanks Mumbai first for thinking through such an event where at least, if not anything, I mean, we do not expect that at the end of two days we are going to have a solid blueprint for how things should go, but at least it would set us thinking a lot in terms of how to deal with this very important event, which is climate change. And just to put a bit of a perspective, I think, uh, I mean, the, as panelists, we talk a lot of technical terms, but to the extent that it's a very diverse audience. I would try to be a bit fundamental when I talk through some of these things so that you know, overall we get a good sense of what we are talking about. Uh, just to give you a perspective, I think, uh, yes, this event is about Mumbai, but uh, you know, put in perspective the fact that 60% of the world population reside in urban centers. So as a result of which, cities are at the forefront to fight climate change, be it mitigation or reducing greenhouse gases. So from that perspective, it is a very micro perspective if you look at. It is contingent on all major cities of the world to really up the ante in terms of fighting climate change. Now coming to Mumbai, of course, like any other coastal city, it, it stands at a great risk because as we are all aware that with every degree rise in temperature, the probability of uh, catastrophic flooding events increase exponentially. And that puts in risk a uh, whole uh, population that reside in cities such as Mumbai. So the question is how to go about it. And unfortunately for us, we do not have much time. I mean, time is ticking. It's been ticking on us for quite a number of years. Uh, the key problem that all of us have been looking at is uh, actually multifold, but to make it more simple, there are two aspects of uh, looking at this. One is what is called as climate mitigation finance, and the other is climate adaptation finance. Climate mitigation finance is nothing but the activities that we do to restrict or try to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So essentially, you are trying to reduce or uh, you know restrict the greenhouse gas emissions. Adaptation is where you become more resilient to the effects of climate change. Because at the end of the day, as much as, as much of mitigating actions you take, you could still have events which are, in a worst case scenario, going to impact you. So how do you become climate smart? And that is where climate adaptation finance becomes important. But as we have seen the trend, chunk of the private capital or public capital is going into climate mitigation finance, which is basically restricting the GHG, greenhouse gases, whereas not enough is coming to the climate adaptation finance. Now, if I were to look at this purely from a financier's lens, and I am a financier by profession, I think it is a very simple thing. It's the risk return. It's the commercial risk versus the commercial return that weighs investments coming into any sector. So, you know, while to finance a renewable power plant is far easy 
because you have a expected stream of cash flows which you basically model to build your finance it becomes very challenging for uh, projects which are supposed to uh, make your city or uh, you know the urban infrastructure more resilient one of the key issues is of course the lack of proper project feasibility studies bankability of the project credit worthiness of the borrower those things become very very important and uh, unfortunately those have come in a very big way in terms of affecting the flow of finance to climate adaptation uh, kind of sectors now having said so this is a this is a this is a huge problem and as uh, aaron was mentioning blended finance and blended finance is nothing that you get some of the multilateral institutions such as theirs or some donor organizations come and you know write uh, risk coverage wraps for commercial bankers to come and finance those projects so that the risk from a commercial bankers point of view gets mitigated and therefore for the same return your risks are reduced and therefore you find the project more viable to finance now i would i would go to challenge uh, you know some of our own thought process that while the world is trying to figure out how to get more private investments into this whole arena of climate finance at home there are there are also streams of uh, capital which could be very well uh, leveraged for example household expenditure so let me talk in terms of a very specific case so household expenditure is if if it goes into buying more evs or bringing or or making buildings more green or more uh, energy efficient you know that in a way is helping the city so if at a at a at a city level there are incentives for these household expenditures to go into some of these areas then in a way you are raising capital so that is one of the things i mean i could give the example of miami for example miami what they do is they basically impose what is called as an impact fee on developers and with that fee they go and you know do a strengthening of their coastline so that if there is a uh, you know surge of water etc coming in the coastline is reinforced so can we not think about it because mumbai for example has a very uh, very bustling real estate sector i mean irrespective of the ups and downs it is probably the costliest real estate and the most buzzing real estate sector in india and uh, I, i do not know whether it is feasible to further increase impact taxes on the builders but even within what you are collecting if you can earmark some which could be channelized to get into climate adaptation kind of mitigating tactics that could be very useful so uh, i think uh, we have a we have a great panel to discuss some of these uh, aspects as we go through and uh, broadly these are my thoughts that uh, we need to make a start and it's a great initiative thank you Thank you, thank you, Dibirat. Uh, my next request is to Sandeep Patacharya, who is India Project Manager for Climate Bonds Initiative. Over to you, Sandeep. Thanks. Uh, first, sorry, uh, am I audible or is? Yeah. Thanks a lot. Uh, first, a lot of thanks for to Mumbai First for considering me for this panel. Uh, so there's been from the morning a lot of talk about what needs to be done. so i would uh, i think i would go slightly against the trend and dwell on what has been done so so that you know that sometimes your own achievements when you are struggling gives you a lot of scope to say that if i have achieved this well i can do more there is no doubt that things are daunting but let's look at some of the numbers last year which is the calendar year 2021 the total amount of investments in renewable energy alone was the estimates vary it was around 16 to say 18 billion dollars in india a large part of it is uh, the utility scale and the others are much much smaller now again i'll refer to what dhruva was saying that there is no market and policy has to create the market so there you go policy has created a market and it is worth the utility scale renewable energy market is at least around 10 billion dollars of investment every year this calendar year it's expected to be 15 billion dollars so first let's look back there is at least one shining example 
of how policy has created the market and money is flowing in. India ranks number two globally on a survey by Ernst & Young uh, on the attractive index for renewable energy. So first, let's look back and say, yes, there's a loss to be done, but there has been a lot done already. This was not easy. If somebody had told you in 2002 that, you know, solar and wind will be much cheaper than uh, coal uh, very soon, you wouldn't have believed them. This is again policy action which created such great demand that it happened. So let's look back and try to see whether we can replicate some of them. Let's not try to reinvent the wheel everywhere. The, let's come to adaptation and resilience. It is a lot, lot more nuanced and it is a lot, lot more difficult to define sometimes, you know. Uh, so the, yesterday I was talking to somebody about climate resilient agriculture. And we were having a conversation. So, you know, the conversation came to that one climate resilient agriculture was the habit of making amras. You know, the mangoes would have rotted. And with varying climate, they'll rot much better. We already have a good infrastructure to make amras, which we love with our puris. So these are some very small examples which are already embedded in. The other example which I would take on adaptation and resilience, again, uh, since I have been a project on uh, climate resilient agriculture and some, some financing model seems to be a uh, uh, business which has an ROI and therefore can be invested in seems to be very clear. One is a few off-takers. Now, the, some of the off-takers have worked with farmers to create agricultural norms or practices which make their crops uh, adaptive. There, there are many, many examples. I wouldn't want to take some of the names because we are in touch. And these are, these are listed companies. And you know, you, before anybody announces anything about their plans, they need to inform the exchange. Otherwise, the exchange will delist them. So, But then there are plenty of agri off-takers who have worked with the farming community to make their farm output climate resilient. There is also this new, uh, sometimes a bit hyped, sometimes a bit overhyped, uh, ag tech firms which work on digitization. Basically, data is cheap, and some of the mobile handsets are also, the smartphones are cheap enough for even the marginal farmer to afford. So they give a lot of advice, which, which is not paid by and large, but that advice creates a crop which then they offtake and create a market linkage, and that's the revenue model of these companies. Some of them have acquired scale, and the year 2021, the estimated investments in these ag tech companies, again, is around uh, close to a billion. I think it's around $800 billion in India. So uh, yes, a lot needs to be done. Uh, policy needs to create markets. There needs to be public-private partnership. There needs to be a lot of dikes, and how, we don't know how dikes can possibly be returned, can give the return. But then there is some hope. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sandeep. Uh, and thanks, all of you, for sharing your perspectives. We now transition to the most interesting uh, session, which is a panel discussion. And we have six speakers, people who have come from various fields. It's a very diversified panel consultants, economists, climate experts, and therefore I think we should make the most of it. Just to share my perspective in a minute or so, I mean, I'm, I'm an accountant, I'm an auditor, and I could never imagine five years ago that I have to completely abreast myself with the ESG norms because there is going to be a legal and a regulatory requirement coming up over the next few years. And we all have transitioned to a certain extent our mind from the boring accounting and auditing to the new norms of governance, to the new ESG, to the fact that environment keeps changing. And it's not just for our clients, but it's for our own individuals, our own families, our own selves as well. So many, many years ago when we started to see and experience the climate change, at that point of time, there was always a concern about what happens. It started to rain in October, November. We've come to know very recently that the entire mango crop in certain parts of Gujarat, etc., 
had actually got rotten because of the fact that the climate changed and there was a lot of rains. I experienced it myself when I carried some mangoes from Gujarat. And at that point of time, I realized that this is because of the climate change. We spoke about the global warming. The global warming happened. And with the global warming, a lot of things started to be of concern. The rising sea levels, the unpredictable weather. We've also learned about the carbon footprint and the kind of carbon emissions that the organizations and the industries have experienced. And again, the carbon credits in terms of ensuring that whatever has been emitted, it's sort of compensated within a period of one year to get back into the control. ESG concept, the environment, the social, and the governance, the three buzzwords today. When I go from one meeting to the other in any organization, one of the top priorities of any organization and of the board is the ESG, and we'll talk about it a little later. So now you have consultants to implement the ESG, you have consultants to audit the ESG, and this is something, maybe I'll share in my closing remarks, that it's the future, because the reporting today to the stakeholders, to the governments, and to many other shareholders is not just going to be on financials, it's going to be on the ESG, and that's why this particular reporting is going to be called as the integrated reporting, or what they say, integrated financial reporting, which is the future. It's happening internationally. It's going to happen in India very soon. And let me tell you that in India as well, India would be one of the early countries to adopt the ESG framework and its audit. And of course, it will keep evolving and it will have an adaptation as well. Finally, of course, we are going to be talking about the most important concept today, and that is financing through green bonds, through green initiatives, and the sustainability of such finance. And of course, we'll talk a little bit about the uncertainties as well. So with this, uh, let me open up the panel discussion. And uh, the way we have set the rules over here is that it's going to be a free flow discussion. I'm not moderating this session. I'm only facilitating. So Shankar, uh, if you could hear me as well. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I am going to be asking questions to specific panelists, and I have requested all the panelists to share their perspective as well, maybe by adding or maybe by deliberating or even disagreeing on a particular download given by a particular panelist. So my first question goes to uh, Namita. Namita, what are some of these uh, market-based instruments that our cities like Mumbai, who are basically the coastal cities, can consider financing the broader climate priorities. We know that the climate changes happen. The city needs a lot of investments. Somebody has to come out with the bonds, the green bonds, the green finance, et cetera. What do you think some of these initiatives could be for a city like Mumbai? Thank you, Pushro. I want to uh, give you two specific examples that can be brought about. And you know, one perspective I want to say is that when we talk about ESG, when we talk about green finance, so far, most of the times, the risk element comes out very strongly, right? I think it's very important to look at it from an opportunity standpoint. And if you look at market-based instruments, I think it's a very fitting opportunity since MBIs really complement the regulatory approach uh, while providing the tools to be, uh, you know, to incentivize the achievement of certain goals. So I would say that if you look at two particular aspects as far as, say, Mumbai is concerned, it's my city. I live here, I've been living here all my life. Uh, we've seen one floods. I mean, every monsoon, we, it creates a havoc. And we have seen how we have to deal with it uh, in terms of economic losses, in terms of, um, in, in terms of livelihoods, etc. And what are the reasons for this? Rivers clogged, wetlands surrounding these are practically non-existent. Uh, which then further jams the drainage systems, so on and so forth. So really the rippling effect that gets created, uh, again, as I said, on economic uh, you know, activity, livelihoods, so on and so forth, asset exposures. I think that is also very important, one of the panelists mentioned earlier. So ma, ma, the BMC, the Brahen Mumbai uh, Municipal Corporation, which is Asia's uh, richest uh, corporation, has the opportunity to look at issuing an adaptation bond, for example, uh, because SEBI, uh, the market regulator, allows municipal bonds for utilities, and uh, you know, channelize that capital, say particularly through private, uh, public-private partnerships in a hybrid annuity model. These models have been very successful. Uh, I think, and, and how do you use that capital? That can be used to undertake, undertake 
upgrades of uh, cities, uh, flood water systems, the drainage systems, creating buffers between the rivers, uh, water lines and adjoining lines, so on and so forth, right? And given that BMC is cash rich, I think uh, there would be there would be large amount of interest. Uh, so th that needs to be looked at. And we've seen examples of how Ghaziabad Municipal Corporation raised a 150 crore uh, bond and has channelized towards uh, you know certain tertiary sewage treatment plants. So. I think these are the kind of opportunities at a granular level that we need to look at because right now we're looking at it from a very 56,000 feet kind of an angle. But how do you percolate mm -hmm. it down to project to project and translate these into uh, transactions and economic value? I think that is a very important point to look at. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think you made some very relevant points of public-private partnerships government may or may not be able to do on its own. But maybe I think uh, our international guests, Stein, Erin, if at all you have a perspective about how these specific uh, financing of coastal cities happen internationally, specifically in the low-lying areas where there is always a greater risk of a flood or of a catastrophe. Um, yeah, I, I can try to answer that. Um, internationally, as I mentioned, with the DFCD model, uh, what, what we try to do uh, to, to actually attract private finance to these uh, nature-based solutions and climate adaptation projects is really thinking about uh, blended finance, but uh, blended finance is not just at a transaction level, as, as, as we just said, but you can also think about blended finance in, in, a, in a time period, so where you do the initial investments by, with public sector money, and then that then uh, enables the private sector to come on board. But as I also showed with the example, you can also think about blended finance spatially, where one public sector project de-risks a private sector project maybe downstream. So I think that is a more creative way of thinking about blended finance and how we then yeah, go about that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Erin. Let me go quickly to because we have got quite a few questions. So let me go to the next question. And maybe Shankar, I believe, uh, given the fact that you work with one of the very premier exchanges of the country, I believe you could also be best placed to respond to this. And my question is that where do you see the bottlenecks in assessing the green finance for the urban development, especially uh, keeping in mind our own city or even India as a whole. Yo, Gushru, I start from where Namita left it because uh, whenever we talk of financing projects or anything, we look at return on investment. And obviously there are risks where the trade enhancement or uh, reducing the risk profile can be helped by not only the government or the local bodies, as well as the private uh, agencies, like I mentioned. The whole issue is about how to get return on investments. Namita mentioned that BMC is a cash-rich organization. It's not about being cash-rich. We are not trying to get funds and paid back from the money that you have. We are trying to see if it can be developed sustainably. I think we have to still be innovative to understand, like for instance, water logging is there. What can we do? So if we reduce the water logging, who will benefit? What will that benefit accrue to? For instance, suppose due to water logging, uh, logging we reduce, uh, we lose around say one week of economic activity in that particular area. If we can reduce that water logging and get the economic activity due to which the municipality makes some money, I think those are the risks that we have to identify, let the investors know and the money will come. This is happening the world over. Whenever we talk, so for instance, renewable energy is also there. We have to an enabling framework where the governments will come back and say, OK, I'll give you this incentive. But this is the cost benefit analysis that I see. I think we have lack of information today. This, these uh, cost benefit analysis should be in the public domain. So people will know whether a solar power generating uh, project really makes benefit uh, to the environment or not. Because uh, we see lots of these uh, projects, they actually technically negative in terms of the benefit for uh, climate or sustainability. So uh, government has to come out with guidelines. The organizations, the private public partnership where we talk about, it should come out with guidelines which say these are the things that we should do. There could be some sample projects, like some of them have been done even in India, like uh, we talked about dams or dikes as they say. Let's look at the urbanization issue. Most of the urban bodies where there is a water problem they are looking at solutions which are short-term solutions. For instance, someone looks at a desalination plant. 
a desalination plant also requires energy and if you make a lake say 20 kilometers or 50 kilometers away from a local body that also requires energy to transfer the water from there to here so we have to compare these projects and see which works better otherwise people will just come and say no no desalination plant requires energy we will fund the energy we will put the pipeline we will pay for it so we require to have generate these sample projects and i think that's one thing that can be done the second thing that can be done is we are looking at the financing and most of the financing will work better if we look at securitization i think these projects everyone tries to look at getting the projects and funded from somewhere securitization is a good way to have good roi projects along with bad roi projects and overall roi project of the projects that are uh, put together these two aspects will get in lots of money and i can tell you investors are waiting in queue for a country like ours and city like mumbai where lots can be done the benefits are huge but someone has to put it proper sure that's my view point thank you shankar i think uh, on a similar note my question goes to dibi as well uh, dibi rat uh, given the fact that you work with a very global bank and i'm sure it could also be one of the ones early ones who would have thought about green financing what is your take on issuance of bonds or issuance of any kind of financing which will help uh, a sustainable urban development absolutely i think you mentioned that we have been at the forefront yes i think publicly we have stated that we have committed a trillion dollars up till to 2030 uh, to espouse the cause of sustainability to help our clients in their climate journey in terms of their transition so that's at a global level i think at the india level we are doing significant amount of work in this sector i mean uh, i myself lead the sustainable finance practice for the bank and uh, in the last few years the kind of progress that we have been able to make with uh, our client partners have been substantial but coming to the specific issue at point here i think i'll i'll, I'll go back to something that i had mentioned early at the end of the day for any institution public or private to finance anything and all of us have been repeating this the risk and returns have to match up uh yes definitely there's a huge global market out there for green bonds sustainability linked bonds and 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 i completely agree that there's a global pool of capital waiting be it on the equity side or the debt side to come in but it comes in to chase the right profile of assets or projects so i think the starting point is to start thinking that how do we pick and choose projects which are bankable which are credit worthy and there are when you approach the bond market i mean forget the international bond market even the local bond market and this is a debate which has been ongoing that the local bond markets the depth is still not there but a minimum credit rating that typically gets good amount of funding is about double a minus double a kind of thing and we need to really look at it from that lens that if at a local market level this is the kind of rating which is required if i were to go uh, and 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 tap the markets externally uh, and which as a country we have so far shied from so while we have had a lot of corporates that we ourselves as a bank have taken to the global bond markets to raise uh, green bonds or sustainability linked bonds but at a at a public institutional level uh, i mean there are banks etc which have gone but for a city such as mumbai to go and raise a bond it's a great idea but there are several enabling provisions that have to happen before that can uh, that can be done and uh, there are already certain countries for example chile chile has taken substantial advances in the area of you know tapping this pool of capital to further their own causes so i think this is a thought process that has to happen at a national level first and then percolate to the city level and once that happens i think the flood gates are there to open up there are plenty of instruments there are plenty of uh right minded investors who are all looking to invest thank you thank you dibi i think uh, a very similar question goes to sandeep uh, sandeep uh, in a city like mumbai we have been hearing that uh, the sea levels go up a little people talk about nariban point as well that it sinks by maybe half a millimeter or one fourth of a millimeter each year and it could be a rumor it could be the fact but yes we are aware that so many cities globally and in india have started to sink as well and we have been talking about climate financing pools besides green finance 
How, how do you think it could be a sustainable framework in so far as this climate financing pools are concerned? How do you think it will operate? And what kind of sustainability, sustainability will it bring to, the, to a better environment? Yeah, so uh, I'll take the latter part of the question. How or what will being, bring the sustainable environment? Uh, and then go to the finance part. Sure. Yeah? So adaptation and resilience for cities, I mean, besides my friends from Netherlands, uh, is you know where you know a lot, large portion of the country is far below sea level uh, is uh, for say coastal cities which can be I am quite sure a lot of that can be applied for coastal cities but I will say while the engineering skills exist in Netherlands how well it is localized and customized will determine how sustainable the environment becomes uh, will a design of a dike or a for or whatever it's called, you copy paste it from Netherlands and apply it in Mumbai, will it automatically make things good? I'm quite sure the answer is no. There is, there is a certain degree of customization and localization and involvement of the community. I'll quote Hisham who was there in the last uh, panel who said, to get things moving is about politics. So in New York City, to create this adaptation plan, they are saying it will create 100,000 jobs. Without the politics going and without the economics going, the rest won't happen, for sure. So that is what will create um, the sustainable atmosphere which we desire. Now once that is in place, I think the next step would be to tap the pools which are dedicated to green. The green capital which you know, the, the likes of Renew Power or Adani Green Energy keeps on tapping by green bonds, issuing green bonds offshore. And ex of course, uh, uh, the Republic of Chile, uh, they started. Yes, and I agree, maybe, you know, the sovereign green bond could be the first step towards it. And then, you know, some collaboration with the right engineering uh, skills to adapt, to create the right atmosphere. And once that economics and politics is there, then the pool will, will start coming. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Sandeep. <clears throat> we immediately go to a very relevant question after this, and this is to Stein. And maybe, Aaron, you can feel free to add there as well. There are certain indicators or parameters which an environmental economist should take into consideration while studying the economic effects of an environmental policy or any business decision prior to publishing his own research and the analysis and the recommendations. What can be done in terms of such, I mean, what should be those specific considerations which he should take into account? And I think, uh, Stein, you come from a consulting world as well, so I'm sure you would definitely be able to throw a better light on this. Yeah, uh, excellent question, I think. And um, yeah, we, yeah we, we do evaluate a lot of these policy, uh, but also business decisions that affect uh, yeah, climate adaptation uh, measures. And uh, I think in the context of finance, let, let's say in the context of finance, uh, it's absolutely crucial to distinguish um, effects for different stakeholders, right? So um, uh, what is the interest in those measures or decisions for private companies that are involved? Um, uh, are they generating revenue from those uh, measures? Uh, are they reducing their risks? in terms of uh, climate vulnerability. Um, and, and, and this shows the interest for private sector to participate in those decisions or measures. On the other hand, you have to look at externalities, right? So you have to look at other stakeholders that are not directly contributing to the project, but that are affected um, so that you, from a societal perspective, as a government, um, but also as a company that want to generate impact, have an idea of how your decisions affect a broader set of stakeholders. Um, creating insight in yeah, who, who gains, uh, who loses from those type of decisions also provides you insight in who might be interested to contribute financially. So I think this is crucial information um, uh, when you design uh, adaptation measures uh, in order to yeah, identify those beneficiaries that are uh, financially uh, able to contribute but are also positively affected and this helps you also to communicate to those stakeholders um, yeah, that, that they are benefiting from your decisions and convincing them that they, they need to contribute financially as well. 
Aaron, would you like to add something? Yeah, just just add very shortly. I mean, we from WF, uh, we, we, we know what is impact and we understand the externalities, but the companies we work with, they don't, well, they, for them still the bottom line is most important and that's profit. So we are trying to quantify physical, regulatory, reputational risks into financial risk and see what needs to be done to mitigate these risks. But we're also helping these companies to, to look at a solid business case and, and come up with healthy returns. Um, and when it comes to climate adaptation and attracting private sector companies to climate adaptation, they don't always need to be so obsessed with the fact that they are contributing to climate adaptation. For them, it's just a sustainable aquaculture project or it's about a sustainable um, green piece of infrastructure that generates returns and provide services to the society. And then uh, the whole ecosystem around these companies, NGOs, governments, they can then quantify the climate adaptation impact and, 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 and assess whether it's actually worth the grants and the other instruments that we provide to these companies. Thank you. Thank you. That's a, that's a very fair perspective uh, you have given. Uh, my next question, I think uh, I, would, I would definitely keep it open for anybody, including uh, Shankar, who, uh, who is also on the video over here. You know, we are going through a very dynamic global environment. Wherever it needs for the businesses keep evolving and the climate changes also keep continuing uh, very regularly. Most important thing over here is that one should be getting the right signals, the right indicators for the change in the climate. And although there are some of the best institutions globally uh, which provide such information on a timely basis to, I would not say avoid, but to prevent the damage to a great extent for those disasters. The point in time information is extremely important because there is a lot of preparation, there is a lot of investment, there are a lot of uh, financing done to ensure that you get this point in time information from this, which businesses' decisions are taken accordingly. What do you think uh, these countries, including India, should be doing in order to ensure that this point in time information should be coming to uh, the individuals or to the organizations who would work towards preventing further damage? It's open. Yeah, Divi, please. Let me take this question because uh, when, when you are asking this question, it reminds me about the city where my headquarter is based. Sort of. We are in London, but we are equally yeah. big in Hong Kong. And if you actually see Hong Kong, the way they manage those typhoons and tornadoes every year, multiple, multiple times happening, uh, it is a model to be followed by all cities. Yes. I think they have done a fantastic job in terms of positioning their uh, data gathering devices for lack of any scientific word uh, and real-time information is used to actually guide the resident population in terms of the severity and how to go about it and you know these large-scale tornadoes or typhoons that pass through the city every year during a certain period of the year goes without doing actually minimal damage so I think it is a lesson to be learned and it's a concrete jungle. It's, it's probably more concrete than we have in Bombay and they have, so there is a lesson to be learned and uh, probably we need to see what model they have followed that can be used here as well. Yes, please, Shine. Can add to that, I think the, the data is crucial, um, but what is maybe even more crucial is the processes that follow if there are, uh, yeah, if, if there are insights that something uh, terrible is going to happen, right? Um, you can have the information, but you need to act immediately um, to make sure people are safe, uh, evacuate, etc. Um, so you also have to institutionalize uh, what comes after. Now, absolutely. Today, if you go to the net and uh, you have certain websites where you can find out how the climate is going to be in any part of the world a month down the line as well. And I'm sure, you know, some calculations, some indicators are there. Many a times it comes out true, many a times it's not. And definitely we cannot blame them because it's nature, it's nature and it's natural that you will never have the point of point in time information and accurate information. Uh, I think we only have about three minutes before we actually wrap it up. So maybe let me open up uh, to the audience in terms of any questions that they have for the panelists. Uh, we'll be happy to sort of, you know, uh, respond. Uh, yes, please. And you can direct the question to any panelist, please. That would be great. Yeah, hi. Um, I'm Tayyip Badr. I'm uh, representing MCGM here. We're 
working with Mumbai Parking Authority. Um, so my question is directed to Stein and Aaron, mostly because uh, uh, because of you're an, an economist, and also because uh, Aaron mentioned something about of the Vietnamese model. And so my question is, and also over the last two days we've been talking about environment and livelihood. So one such thing that comes to my mind is, is that of payment for ecosystem services. An idea, so for the audience, uh, a service provided to manage a, an environmental resource. Um, so when you sort of recognize that it is a service and you tend to financialize, monetize it, that's an environmental uh, service, and then payment for it. So, um, so something like that where citizens participate to manage the environment and then we bring in the market, we bring in the state to sort of create a system where money can flow for better management of environmental resource for source protection. And something like that has been done in Vietnam. For example, Vietnam is one of the first countries which has a national policy for uh, payment for ecosystem services. Now, my question is, is that for, because, and we have sort of covered it in some degree, um, that there is a clear role of state, there is a clear role of market, and there is a clear role of citizen participation. So, in such a model where we want to bring in finance, we want more participants, and with, without, and we are also looking at normatives of sustainability, efficiency, equity, livelihoods, all of that combined, and, and of course environment, which is why we are here. So, something like that, what, what sort of models could be replicated? Could it be the Chinese model, where the state is heavily controlling the, uh, the, eco the ecosystem services, or Vietnam, where there is a hybrid model, something like new institutional economics, or something which just totally opens it to the market? Yeah, I think there are, there are various options that you can pursue in this, uh, in this sense. Um, uh, I think in, if you're talking about payment for ecosystem services, it's, it has become a bit of a catch-all term, and there are many sorts of serv services that you can, can monetize. Um, but coming back to your question on how to, to arrange it, you need some kind of structure to coordinate the funds, right, to, to, to direct the funds. Um, uh, and there are transaction costs involved with this. And, and often with payment for ecosystem services, there are uh, a lot of uh, beneficiaries um, uh, and there are a lot of suppliers that provide these ecosystem services. Um, and there needs to be something in between that can yeah, manage those funds and direct them from the demand to the, the supply to the demand and, and vice versa. And um, I think there, there are various models, but uh, something that we've seen also recently uh, yeah, arising more and more is, is something that's more hybrid, uh, such as uh, trust fund structures, for example, um, that are yeah, uh, governed by both private sector, um, but also can be representatives from the public sector involved as well, um, that have an interest in uh, the area that is being managed by these payment for ecosystem service mechanisms. Um, but that also has had the, 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 um, uh, a governance uh, uh, aspect that involves private sector specifically and also ensures that they have a say in how those funds are being, being spent and also can um, uh, yeah, uh, mobilize them to invest in, in this type of funding systems. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have a well, half a minute I perspective? I just want to add that it, it's a great model, but uh, it's not proliferating, so it's not picking up. So I think we need to uh, invite the private sector, be that uh, intermediate uh, role, and then really make it a profitable model, because otherwise... Absolutely, yeah. Of course, so for want of, uh, for want of time, I think uh, maybe there is an opportunity over lunch to interact with the panelists. I'll just wrap it up in half a minute. I think it's not just the initiatives of governments, public sector, private sector, combination of public sector, private sector, boards, it is we ourselves as well. To what extent we create pollution, to what extent we create problems, to what extent we define the laws of nature. And I think it's extremely important for us to create more awareness within us and for our families and for our friends and others to ensure 
that these ESG norms are completely complied with because we are sitting on a ticking time bomb. Anything can happen at any point of time. I'm not a pessimist. I'm a very optimistic person. But this subject, trust me, this subject has taken the highest level of priority in the boardrooms of late. And this is something I want to reiterate. I mentioned in my opening remarks, I once again mentioned that the corporates have started to take it up very, very seriously in terms of something that, you know, we, uh, we were so concerned about the Y2K in the year 2000 when the millennium changed. And at that point of time, we managed it so well. There were no major issues. Now, maybe in the next two, three years, the ticking time bomb is the ESG and the global climate change. So it's ourselves who need to be ready. And I think we need to sort of, you know, contribute to the ecosystem to make sure that this particular ticking time bomb is defused as a result of which we should be in a position to live in a much more safer and a sustainable environment. With this, I would wrap up my panel discussion. I thank every panelist over here for sparing his uh, valuable time to be here this afternoon and sharing the perspectives. And thanks to the organizers of the event for the opportunity given to us. Thank you so much.